The Nepp Estate in Horsham, West Sussex, is known as one of the best sites for nature in the whole country. It's also an internationally renowned rewilding site, a pioneering conservation project, and we've introduced species like beavers and white storks, and the fields and forests full of an incredible abundance of wildlife and their famous wild roaming herbivores has given it the nickname the African savannah of England, our very own Serengeti. And tonight, I get to camp there. I live only half an hour away from Nep, so I've been lucky enough to visit many times before, but just like a true safari adventure, it never loses its magic and I always see different animals every time I go. I was so excited to see what I might stumble across this time, you just never know what might be around the corner. And with this being my first time there at night, there was a chance to experience a whole new host of nocturnal animals that only roam after dusk. I couldn't wait to pitch up and start the camping adventure. We made it! Look how beautiful it is here. The beautiful wildflower field where they've just mown like a ring where everyone can pitch their tents. So even though you're in a field full of campers, it feels like you've got your own little space. It's lovely. We're also kind of doing this a bit glamping style because we've got a massive um, sleeps four tent. You know, when they say sleep four, it's just more of a comfortable two. And because we could drive here and the park park is really near to where we're camping, we've got like a double air mattress. We brought our duvet, our pillows. You know, if you can go comfortable, why not? The one thing I didn't bring, however, was a pump. So I've got to blow up this, this double <laughs> air bed mattress. Um, with just my lungs, so yeah, we'll see how that goes. How long do you reckon it's going to take me to blow this bad boy up? Possibly a while. I've done it before though. I've done it at Reading Festival. It can be done. The key is persistence, I think here. I think that's the only key to it. It's the only thing that's going to help me. <laughs> this was a mistake. <laughs> I'm so dizzy. I remember it going up so much quicker when I used to pump this up at festivals. Yeah, I don't know, maybe I had magic lungs back then. Or maybe I just had very selective memory. <laughs> Probably the latter. Just still blowing up the air mattress and a stork flew by. Go. Where else in the UK can you just be blowing up a tent and a stork flies by? They are massive. It's actually amazing seeing such a large creature back in our skies. It really does feel like you're somewhere really wild. Really cool. The storks flew above and around our heads for hours as we settled into camp, and it was amazing to have that suddenly be a common backdrop where anywhere else it would be unheard of. Storks were introduced here at Nep to begin to restore the land and species that once would have roamed these lands. These incredible birds over winter in Africa and fly all the way here just to breed come spring and summer walking through the long grass to toss up insects and catch them in their big bills which breeding partners clatter together to greet one another when meeting on their ginormous nests. This bill clattering creates a sound that hasn't been heard in the UK since the Middle Ages. So, camped all up, we're just going to go for our first walk now. This place is Nep. It's a rewilding site and I think it's about 320 acres. It used to be farmland, um, non-productive farmland in that they couldn't turn a profit until 2001 when the owners, Isabella Tree and Charlie Burrell decided to do something different. They had an interest in conservation and they'd heard of this concept called rewilding, which is basically letting the land go back to its natural processes and develop as it would naturally without human intervention. And so they spoke to some experts and they decided to go ahead with it. And I mean, you can never predict what's gonna happen, but it has been an absolutely overwhelming success. And this is one of the most inspirational, pioneering conservation stories we have in England, indeed in Europe at the moment. And this place is teeming with life. I can't wait to show you it. Also, we're gonna play bingo because they have um, 
loads of different herbivores here so they have longhorn cattle, Tamworth pigs, Exmoor ponies and they have three species of deer that you have to try and find around so we're going to play herbivore bingo as well, very exciting. You can go on real safari tours here but we decided to explore on foot. It's so exciting not knowing what you might stumble across around each corner. The common species are here in abundance and the rarer species are recovering in staggering numbers. And of course, their herbivores like the deer, cows, ponies and pigs are all somewhere on the land if only you were lucky enough to find them. You can hear cuckoos here, once the dependable sound of summer. Nightingales and turtle doves have suffered more than a 95% decline in their populations, but here they are thriving. NEP has all five UK owl species, 13 of the 17 bat species. You can find over 20 beetle species in just one piece of dung here. They have nesting peregrine falcons, the fastest bird in the world, and the white stork, which until now hasn't bred in the UK since 1415. And it can feel like you're stumbling over butterflies, with staggering numbers like 87 purple emperors being seen in one morning which is a butterfly species you'd be lucky to see even one of anywhere else. Nep is even reintroducing beavers back into the landscape, restoring the land back to a time where our waterways were engineered by these magnificent mammals. Hello, post um, recording Chloe here. I just thought I'd interrupt because I actually went back to Nep just today, this time for work because I work in conservation and I was so lucky enough to be taken in to the beaver enclosure and have a tour and I've come back with these souvenirs that I wanted to show you. So this is the wood chip from Beaver Nori and this is a stick that it's actually gnawed. You can see they strip the bark right back and I got to go in the enclosure. It's utterly incredible in there. So I thought I would share the shots with you as a sneak peek because no one else is really meant to be in there at the moment. A pair of beavers were first introduced in Nep in 2020. But despite the fencing and enclosures, one escaped and later died of septicemia. And so it was only in February of this year that Net received another pair to try again to bring these magnificent creatures back to this landscape. Beavers are nocturnal, so we weren't going to see them, but the signs of them were everywhere. We found a lot of stripped and peeled away bark, a great sign to look out for when hunting for beaver. We even found the prints of their feet and tail from a midnight wander and the fully fledged beaver dam of sticks and mud doing its job of holding back the water. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, cool. Do you, Fran, do you remember how, or Ken, do you remember how long ago it was that we lost the last wild beaver in the UK? Yeah, yeah, no, we had nothing to do with this. Look at all the mud that impacted it. Yeah. So good, isn't it? Beavers were lost from our landscape 400 years ago when they were hunted to extinction, and their loss has been devastating for our ecosystems. They are what's known as ecosystem engineers, as they can be solely responsible for creating wet woodlands, floodplains and thriving clean water systems. These two beavers have only been here four months and they've already transformed this grassy meadow into a beautiful habitat. And this was all by just blocking one single tiny trickling stream. Most of us don't know it because we've never seen it, but this is what England should look like. But it doesn't because the beaver isn't here. It isn't until you see the difference they make with your own eyes that you realise just how awfully we have mucked up this world. I just don't understand why we seem to think there isn't enough beauty and wonder in this world worth protecting.
finished up our walk and full transparency we were planning to go in the lake their swimming lake but it got a bit overcast and cold and we decided yeah maybe we'd wait till tomorrow morning where it's meant to be a bit nicer and I'm really glad we did because we actually went to go check out the lovely outdoor baths which we were planning to get cold in the lake and then go have a warm bath but it wasn't running warm so we would have just been really cold particularly me I really struggle to get warm once I get cold so instead we just had a lovely shower and now it's time for dinner so we're gonna cook salmon over the fire which would be delicious and have that with some quiche and salad and then just spend the evening in front of the fire there's nothing better also for the essentials from the farm shop didn't I gingerbread biscuits and gingerbread bar cannot go wrong there are so many slugs along this path oh my god I've never seen so many look how many slugs slug slug Slug. 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 Slug, slug, slug. That word starts to sound really weird when you keep saying it. As we cooked over the fire, the wildlife sightings didn't stop. Goldfinches were constantly flying in and out of the wildflowers surrounding our tent, and the kestrel was back hovering above, and the storks continued to put on a show. I hadn't camped in nearly two years until this trip, and I'd completely forgotten how peaceful and stilling it is for the body and mind. The buzz of electric wires was replaced by the crackling of the fire. Screen time was replaced with watching the sunset, and fireside chats replaced texting over the phone. Sunsets and a dancing fire, the last songs of the birds and a darkening night sky all seem to set the scene for wholly different conversation topics that just don't fit into a busy and urban world. But in this setting, silence is often the most valued form of conversation. A stilled quiet fell upon my mind, until all, all I was was the sound of fire and owls and the sight of a sky melting into dark. one of the first up it is about 6 a.m. so very understandable. Oh, it's a bunny right in front of me. Obviously the birds have long been up and the sun starts to shining through my tent so I always tend to wake up early when camping but I feel refreshed so that's really nice. So I think I'm gonna have some breakfast and then just go for oh, I'm scared of blackbird go for a little wander while I wait for Josh to get up on the sun.
tent amongst the wildflowers. Time for some oats now for breakfast and then a walk. Because what else do you have for breakfast when you're camping? Or indeed, breakfast anywhere. I've had oats my whole life and it may well continue that way for the rest of my life. They're lovely. Don't fix what ain't broke. I'm like the direct straight line between the two. It just keeps periodically literally like flowing like right over my head. Like I can feel the air from his wings. <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna be able to capture it. It's so funny. I probably look a right state. So got bed hair, wearing this really fluffy fleece. Yeah. Got these small camo shorts on. And then my hiking boots. Uh, blue backpack. Yeah, it's just all a bit of a gate. It's all a bit of a scene. Are you cold or are you warm, Chloe? Shorts or fluffy winter jacket? Make your mind up. Both. So I thought we could talk a bit about Ooh, green finch. It's like you just wander around and wherever you look up suddenly there's a stork's nest there's just this one right there they are just massive i mean storks are massive birds so it goes with that they have massive nests like it's the equivalent their equivalent if you scaled up a blue tit they'd probably make a nest that big but still my god you're just not used to seeing um big creatures in british landscape are you we're just not used to it at all which is a shame because you know they should be here they're absent not just not present so i said that um net another stalk oh wow everywhere they're everywhere anyway we'll try it for the third time i said that nep is a rewilding site but for a lot of you you might not have heard that word it's a big buzz oh it's so close okay, hang on i'm gonna get a shot of you So what actually is rewilding? Well, people argue a lot over the definition, but the general idea is that um, it's a conservation principle, conservation management principle. So it's a way of conserving, protecting, enhancing, restoring a landscape. So traditional conservation methods include coming in and saying, I want to improve this habitat, like I want to improve the forest land. So I'll plant more trees or I want to protect this species so I'll do everything with this one species in mind but rewilding takes a whole ecosystem approach and it also takes a hands-off approach it says I want to restore this whole ecosystem the habitats all the species within it all the interactions and I'm going to do this by letting it do its own thing in recovery I don't give it a helping hand human hands off the steering wheel and nature just regenerates and restores itself as it would naturally um, which to me just you know it makes total sense for all our curiosity and ingenuity to even study and fully understand one species out of the estimated 8.7 million on this planet would take a lifetime after lifetime if it could even be achieved because the complete number of interactions just one species will have with countless others in an ecosystem it's just astonishing we don't even understand ourselves, so how can we expect to understand anything else, let alone a whole ecosystem? Species have been evolving side by side, hand in hand, developing their interactions for centuries upon centuries. The recipe for a healthy ecosystem is baked into every one of them. Everything will recover and restore together. They know what to do, so let them do it. The introduction of wild roaming herbivores is one of the few interventions NEP does do, but it was done to allow the ecosystems to help restore itself. Before we kind of wiped them all from the landscape or domesticated them, Europe and England was roamed 
by wild herbivores. So we had things like the aurochs and true wild ponies and wild boar. And so here at NEP, they've introduced proxies for those, the closest we can get to mimic the effects those herbivores would have on the landscape. So they've got longhorn cattle as proxies for the auroch. They've got Exmoor ponies, which is pretty much as close to a wild pony as you can get now. I think there's a horse called the Pr oh God, how do I say Przewalski horse, which was seen as the true European ancestral one. But Exmoor is as close as you can get now. Um, they've got three species of deer, which obviously they are just wild behaving. And then they've got Tamworth pigs, which are the proxies for wild boar. And the effects these herbivores have on the landscape is amazing. Each one of them grazes and interacts with the landscape in a different way, and so they all create different habitats. Pigs display a behaviour called rootling, where they churn the ground with their snout looking for food. This disturbs the seabed for new plants, creates ditches of puddles and water, and makes a feeding ground for weight hunters like birds looking for an easy worm or bug snack in the freshly turned ground. The cows, ponies and deers all have their own individual effects too, their wild roaming status affording them the freedom to choose what, where and when they eat, creating a variety of vegetation and soil disturbance effects that supports countless number of species. Because of their impact, no two fields at NEP are developing the same. With so many species here now, and three roaming herbivores, it really does feel like England's equivalent of the Serengeti, with deers instead of gazelles and cattle instead of buffalo. The only thing missing in this ecosystem are true predators. In Africa, this would be your lions, cheetahs and leopards. Here, it should be the lynx, wolves and bears. What is happening here at NEP? It really could be in an ideal world where it works would be the future of conservation in the UK. The successes they have had here at NEP in such a short space of time is staggering. And this land, not two decades ago, was farmed within an inch of its life, plastered in pesticides and insecticides, so churned and churned, all nutrients removed and with little room for wildlife. And now look at it, it's absolutely teeming with wildlife. It's called the African savannah of the UK. You know? The first time I came here, I was astounded at the amount of wildlife here. I felt so lucky to have it on my doorstep. But then I took a step back and thought, but this isn't even a thriving ecosystem. This yet. isn't what England should be. And I'm amazed at this. And you just suddenly think, wow, how depleted are the rest of our countryside. And that can make me quite sad. But this place here is a story for hope. Ecosystems can restore, life can come back. And it is utterly glorious when it does. Utterly glorious, so hopefully it's mainly just a story of hope.